On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named Blanche, and Blanche was in a relationship with a jealous physical abuser. It's a story of control, put-downs, family enablers, smear campaigns, threats, stalking, and finding yourself in the aftermath. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. I am Brandon Chadwick, and with me today, we have Blanche. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I am doing well. Thank you for asking. And if you want to be a guest like Blanche is today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. And there you can read all of our instructions and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our Guest Form and press the Submit button. And please do send it in the format that we ask for. And there is a content warning for this episode as we do discuss physical abuse throughout this episode in graphic detail. There's also suicide threats and threats to Blanche's life as well. And it's all throughout the episode. So that is your content warning for you today. And today we're going to hear Blanche's story and... She was 19 when this started, and she went through a lot of emotional and physical abuse, psychological abuse, and we're just happy that Blanche is here to tell her story, and now I'm going to get out of my way and your way. Thank you, Blanche, for being here. The floor is now yours. Hi. Thank you for having me. Um, Yeah, so I grew up right outside of D.C., Um, with a great family, two parents that are still together to this day, and one younger sister. Uh, My parents did meet their sophomore year of college. Um, But yeah, like I said, still together. Um, My sister is two years younger than me, and we are very, very close. Um, By the time that I hit high school, maybe even college, a lot of my friend's parents actually were divorced I feel like it was actually more rare to have parents that were still together and I don't feel that my sister and I were raised to believe that divorce was shameful in any way um it didn't ha- if it didn't work out it didn't work out um and there was no abuse in our house at all while we grew up there were fights but I feel like that's pretty normal um So before the relationship that I'm going to talk about began, I do feel like I had a good amount of friends. Um, I felt that I definitely had low self-esteem and I was a people pleaser. Um, I never really liked when people were mad at me. So I felt like I always had to like fix the conflict. So when my ex and I had started dating, I felt like a lot of my friends were getting into relationships. Um, At the time, three of my roommates actually all were in relationships out of all of us. So So you had low self-esteem while you were a teenager? Yes, actually, I was 18 at this time. When when did your low self-esteem begin? I mean, I feel like maybe right when I started college, because it was such a new experience for me, um, being away from home too. So probably around there. Um, but I just didn't really know a lot about relationships either. I, I thought it was pretty normal to allow multiple chances and that like relationship relationships took work, um, which is true in some circumstances, but when we started dating, it was a very, like a very slow burn. Um, the physical abuse didn't start for at least nine months in, and it was more devaluation and isolation at the beginning. So tell us about who this person was, is everything about them, how they wanted to be seen in hindsight, how they really were. Um, so we, we went to middle school together and high school, actually. Um, we were kind of on and off in high school. Um, 
I think that knowing he like he had a lot of friends in high school too so I do think he was I do think he was well liked um when we were younger um but it wasn't until fall that we started dating fall of my of college um and we had reconnected on snapchat um and he sent me something and I replied and there really wasn't like that much communication between us it was just we visited each other back and forth and then the relationship progressed pretty quickly um, after that. And I think that was because of our history. But the first few months, they were they were pretty good. Um, and then the jealousy started to show. Um, he wanted to know, like, every little detail about my past, every person I had been with, all the details of it. And I, like, he would say that this was normal to discuss. And I didn't know better and definitely made me feel very uncomfortable. But um, after I would tell him details of stuff, he would then call me a slut or call me a whore. And then that would obviously upset me. And he would say it was only because he cared about me and did not like that I had been with other people. Did you discuss that with other people? I had told one of my friends at the time I, I believe I told her something about how she he was getting really jealous and how he had also not liked if I thought anybody else was attractive. And she was like, that's not normal. Um, and so when I had gone back to him and said, like, this isn't normal, he was like, why are you telling other people our business? Um, so then it was like kind of turning her opinion on what she, what I had said. So right here, very early on, you're being devalued, you've reached out for support, you've discussed your support with him, and that gets turned on you in the sense of what happens in a relationship stays in a relationship, probably loyalty questions uh, mm -hmm. in, in there as well, and very quickly an isolation forms as far as who you can and cannot talk to about everything you know it starts off here with information that goes on within the relationship but you're also you know already being questioned about people of your past yeah um, so there's a lot of things already happening pretty quickly but again you're young vulnerable and this is all new and relationships take work yeah um and then so after that type of jealousy he would start to get jealous if I was looking in another like even in the direction of another guy he would accuse me of checking them out and I was I mean I was not doing that but I think this was when like the mental manipulation started and like the gaslighting because he would tell me that I was um and I would be like I would get upset because I knew I wasn't so I would argue it but then he would kind of throw in my face and say I'm being argumentative and so that would upset me. But then he would tell me things like he's never met anyone like me and that I was special. And so I think it was that constant love bombing after an argument that like kept me going back. And since I did have low self-esteem at the time and this is my first relationship, I didn't know better. <laughs> um, so at this point, these things are happening pretty quickly. Yeah, pretty quickly since when we started. What do you like about him? Like, what are the things that you were like right away before this even started happening where you were like, ah, oh, this guy, this is the guy? Um, I definitely was um, physically attracted to him, but I do think, I really do think it was just the history in high school that we had that I was like holding on to. And it felt like a safe net, safety net to be kind of with someone that I already knew, not having to like reintroduce myself again to someone. Um, but moving on, he, he had told me New Year's Eve that year, which is like three months into the relationship that he, um, loved me. And I didn't know if that was like early or not. I mean, it felt early for me, but I, um, I didn't like, didn't know better. And then on Valentine's day, he said he wanted to go to Spain and he gave me a promise ring that same day. So we ended up buying tickets to go to Spain for August. So like six months down the road. And, um, it definitely was that idea of like planning so far in advance and like 
the promise ring is giving me some sense of like, we'll be together longer. And I, looking back at it, I do, I mean, I know that the promise ring was him dang, like dangling a carrot in front of me type of analogy. Um, it was also just that idea of the future, which definitely kept me hooked. So at this point, there had been still no physical abuse. It was just all the devaluing through calling me a whore or a slut for my past. But um, he would tell me that I couldn't get anyone better than him. He was the best I was going to get. And I definitely started to doubt, like, believe that at one point because I was like, I mean, I haven't had any other boyfriends. Like, maybe he is right. Um, But... I I just kind of did start to believe him. Um, and then more of the jealousy, he just started to not like if I had any, it was really any guy's phone number or Snapchat or anything in my phone. Um, and so I ended up having to block people, delete them. Um, and then it progressed to if I had liked people's pictures on Instagram, like from even like five years before we started dating. He would like go onto some guy's Instagram if I was following them and like scroll to like the bottom picture and see if I liked it. So I ended up deleting Instagram because I just couldn't deal with him getting mad over it daily. So the first time he punched me was May 2019. And we were at the beach with his friends. So like for context, like this was right before we're supposed to go to Spain. Like this is the summer we're going to Spain. And he already, like, had professed his love for, for me, like, given me a promise ring and everything. So I'm, like, I feel like it was just easier to give him a second chance because I would, at least at the time, um, because he had never been physical before that moment. Um, I remember my sister had asked me, she had seen me, like, the next weekend and saw the bruise that I had in my arm. Like, it was, like, this huge this size bruise and she had asked if it was from him and I lied and I remember she said to me like if it is like that's not okay and I knew that I think that it was just that honeymoon phase of like after being um after he did something horrible that like kept me going back um so you're in I guess like the calm phase before like after the abuse happens then there's a calm phase yes yeah so you're in that calm phase how are you feeling right after the abuse happens the physical abuse happens Mm -hmm. and what are you saying to yourself in your brain are you are you trying to rationalize it or are you scared like what is going on Definitely trying to rationalize it. I mean, he was he was saying how sorry he was and like how it would never happen again. Um, that like he loved me so much. I mean, completely felt like he felt bad. Um, and I even remember he had like called his mom and said like something like he like called her and she was saying like kind of enabling him honestly, like just not even agreeing with anything I said but um I mean I don't think I was scared at that point I feel like that whole like him saying he was sorry and that he loved me made is what made me keep like made me go back I mean I was like okay like what's another chance like there's like that was like my mentality like what's one more chance um so but then we did go to Spain Um, and like the jealousy continued there too. It was like still the whole checking, if I check someone out there, um, and I just started to like, I started to feel like if I was walking in public with my head up, like it was going to stir an argument. So I started to feel like I actually had to walk with my head down sometimes. Um, and there definitely was some physical abuse there too, but it wasn't like a lot, like it wasn't often. It was like, so that was like, It was very slow, um, but... Is that, like, more of, like, grabbing of arms and things like that? Yeah. I mean, it definitely wasn't very intense. Like, yeah, it was, like, grabbing and pushing, but it wasn't completely visible at the time. Um, So I'm now supposed to go to Australia 
for six weeks and he gets mad that I had applied and I did not tell him if I like could. I didn't ask him. But at that point, there was nothing I could do about it. And so while I was gone, a lot of the devaluing like escalated. Um, I think that's just with being away and he didn't want there to be like peace between us um, and like was trying to take away fun for me. Um, he like didn't want me going out. Um, if I posted like a certain picture, he would say that I looked, I was an embarrassment for wearing that. Or if I like was hanging out with any of the guys on the trip, he would like be rude about it. Um, and at the time I was, I was very homesick, definitely dealing with like a borderline eating disorder and every girl on the trip had a boyfriend. So I think that's just adding to the self-esteem. And I thought it was easier to have someone to talk to. Um, so do you feel that, yes, he is invading your boundaries at this time? Yeah. But at the same time, he's also playing a rescue character in the sense of being homesick and listening to you when you do need help specifically with, you know, um, an eating disorder stuff that's going on and how you're feeling about yourself. Like there's, it's a mixed message of like jealousy, rage, anger, but then there's this, uh, part of him that does kind of swoop in and be that boyfriend that you want him to be. Yeah, no, I think that he was being support, like trying to be supportive, but like still also causing me a majority of the stress while being there. And I didn't realize that at the time, but there was like, it was like that having those arguments were, was the stress um, besides dealing with like the other stuff too. Um, it was him saying like, I miss you. I can't wait for you to get home, but then getting mad about something else. But I got back in February. So after the six weeks and the event that pretty much sealed the deal with like friends like this is kind of where like the isolation definitely increased um was I was living with five other girls and it was one of their birthdays and she had invited like a ton of people to come hang out and so I invited my ex and one of the guys that showed up had been I had been with a year ago and like we were not together we actually like hadn't really talked at all and I remember my ex put me off at the party and my roommates saw this and at that point we had been drinking but they still saw him do that and they said that they saw it and that flipping you off is not okay like in any context so things spiraled out of control a little bit and I remember him storming through the house to grab his stuff and like grabbing my arm and pushing me out of the way and leaving that night and then the next morning I woke up and I met him somewhere halfway. And he started by turning the story onto like as if he was the victim. It was, I could have gotten in an accident driving home drunk and how hurt he was, they kicked him out. I mean, it did make me feel horrible then, even though I, he wasn't the victim. It just, it did make me feel pretty bad. And I was in my car about to leave. He was in his car. And we had decided that ending was best. And I remember him getting out of his car and saying, can we not do this? Like, I'm so sorry. And all the love bombing techniques again. And I just feel like at that point, I was at a very low self-esteem still because he was driving a wedge between like me and all my friends. Um, so we had ultimately decided to stay together. And he, would say, he did say he would go to couples therapy. But of course, like we never went and that was not even ever looked into. But I get home from talking to him and all my roommates pile in my room and they're basically just telling me how he treats me like shit. Um, they can hear the way he talks to me through the walls. Uh, one of them even said that she heard him read the, re the list he had made of the reasons he hated me. And then another one said that he grabbed me so hard last night that I probably have a bruise. And I, I was just like, it was so hard to wrap my head around them saying all this because I didn't understand at the time. I mean, my confidence had gone even lower from the, from where it had started. And I just felt like honestly a shell of a human, but. 
how did you feel hearing that from them that they saw it? Yeah, I was definitely confused. I mean, I thought they liked him, but I guess it was just hard to tell because I mean, they weren't, they weren't telling me everything they saw until they like really saw that or how they felt. Um, but I mean, it was also just scary. I mean, we're all, we were all so young, maybe like 19 or 20 at the time. So, um, after they left, I looked at my arm and the one who said that there would be bruises was right. And there were four little like blue bruises. So from how hard he had grabbed me, it was like almost like fingerprints. And then they did voice that they didn't want him coming back, that they feared their life around him. And like I said, I was confused. And like, I did think that time could heal that. And eventually they would come around, but obviously they didn't. And I completely understand that now, but it was definitely harder than to be like, why don't they like him? Like I like him, but he wasn't treating me right. And they knew that. So three days after this COVID hit full force and our school closed. So I packed up most of my stuff and I left and a couple months go by. And one of the roommates texts me and she asks if I'm moving out or like what I'm doing. And I say, I'm going to move out. So I ended up moving out and living alone my senior year. And I do think that in retrospect, if COVID hadn't hit, we probably would have ended sooner. But then we were truly isolated. I mean, it was really just us all day, every day. I don't think there was much physical abuse at that time. It was still like a lot of the devaluing, but now I've been isolated. Um, and our schools opened back up. And I was driving basically from his his school, my school, he was visiting. We weren't really doing much. It was really just us two. Um, I graduated May 2020. And he actually stayed with me that night before my graduation, but didn't come to the ceremony. And I mean, that was the thing with him. If there was a holiday or anything that was about me, there was bound to be some sort of fight or he wouldn't show up. What was the excuse for not showing up to your uh, graduation? Um, he said he needed to go to the gym. And so he left to go to the gym. Um, but yeah, I mean, I made, ex- I remember making so many excuses for him. Like, yeah, he does need to go. I mean, that's what he needs to do. But I mean, that was a pretty important day. And I, I have read a lot about narcissists not wanting to show up on important days for other people, but themselves. Um, so at this point, I am living fully alone. And most of my friends from school are not really my friends anymore. And I did feel very isolated. I felt like I really did only have him. And there wasn't much, like like I said, there wasn't much physical abuse here. But what he would do is he would continuously break up with me and then stonewall me by blocking me on everything. And it would just leave me a mess because it would be like, like I said, at the beginning, I always wanted to fix the conflict. And so I'd be like, you're not even going to talk to me. And like, especially being blocked on everything, it's like, how do we talk out a problem? So I did try to set a boundary. And I said, I was not going to wear this promise ring he had given me a couple months before until we stopped fighting. Um, so I did stop wearing that for a while. And I think things were pretty okay for a little bit. Um, I think he started to back off like the devaluing for a little for the honeymoon phase like doing the honeymoon phase again that was kind of it I mean it was a little bit calm for a little I I would say (laughs) are you recognizing cycles at this point that you're going through yeah I definitely was realizing that I was starting to realize some of the cycles and I I knew I could see them but it was just like giving those second chance, like the second and third chance. I mean, in the like love bombing, it made it hard to like, feel like, oh, like it's fine. Like maybe he will change. I mean, that hope of change. There was an incident that like drove a wedge um, further between my parents. Like I remember we went out to this, I think we went to his college and we got in an argument and he pushed me onto the ground. And he said to me, like, see what you're making me do. And that same night, he, like, 
took my phone away from me and smashed it on the ground. And he drove home and fell asleep, causing us to crash. And he crashed my car. Um, I don't really think he ever apologized for that. But I remember I fell asleep in the back and I was supposed to keep him awake. And so that whole accident cost us like $6,000. And we had agreed to split it um, because he said it was half my fault. Yeah. And so that was kind of like this was starting like the turmoil between my family um, and like work. He so since he had agreed to split it and he didn't have a job, um, he needed a job. So he started to work at the same place as me. And now this was causing me stress at work. I mean, he would show up high and he would steal things and abuse me while there. So it was just this constant stress of keeping the peace at work and with my coworkers and with him. Um, just, I mean, it was so stressful. And so now I'm like isolated from all my old friends and he's kind of driving a wedge between my family because this car accident. And now he's creating uncomfort at my job. And it just felt like he was really just creating conflicts everywhere. Um, I was able to get him to quit. Um, so that was able to alleviate some of the stress there. So before, you know, you've mentioned that you guys get into arguments. What are the arguments that would get started? Are they just about absolutely nothing and he just goes? Yeah, I mean... It was really all looking back. It was a lot of the jealousy thing. And then it would be if I said, if I disagreed with him, and then it was me being argumentative. I mean, I had been told I was argumentative in the past, but like not to that degree where I'm like lying about what happened. Um, so it was definitely all that. And then sometimes it would just be like, okay, like you're right. I did, like, I would just bend backwards for him because I would just, just to keep the peace. <laughs> so he's, Blaming you for everything. Yep. He's making you take responsibility for everything. Mm -hmm. He is a jealous person who will start arguments over something and then blame those things on you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He is someone who is just a conflict creating machine wherever he goes. Yeah. I assume cannot hold a job. Yes, cannot hold a job. That is true. <laughs> uh, probably takes zero responsibility and blame shifts wherever yeah. they're going. Someone who needs to be right, even if they're wrong, does not like the word no. Mm -hmm. And is a gaslighter yeah. and is physically abusive. They're mm -hmm. an intimidator and impulsive i'm going to assume yeah yes um and all around danger to you everyone around them and himself mm -hmm. and will just blame everyone else for his problems yeah i mean yeah you covered it all there um he, I mean, I definitely think that he learned a lot of these tactics and stuff, or not even, I mean, I do think his dad was a narcissist as well and potentially physically abusive towards his mom. I'm not 100%, but, um, I mean, he definitely, he, he was never told no. I mean, anything his parents or anything he wanted, it was a yes from his dad or a yes from his mom. <laughs> Um, they were, they treated him like he was their golden child. Um, and I do, there was like an altercation between his dad, um, and his, him and his dad. And at one point they essentially kicked him out of the house though. So he was now living in my basement of my parents' house. It was just so stressful to have him be there and keep the peace with my parents now. Cause there's already like a little bit of stress with us in that accident. And during the time we were there, he actually did end up punching two holes in my parents' basement walls. Um, they even asked us about it, and he flat out lied to them. I mean, a couple of years go by, and I asked my parents about it, and they were like, we knew he was lying. I mean, it was pretty obvious. Um, Are these things, because, you know, how long into the relationship is this right now? 
about two years into the okay. relationship. It's two years. And based upon how you're talking about things, it just seems that like these things are happening rapid fire. Oh yeah. I like, mean, they started increasing significantly faster after we grad after we graduated and during COVID or after COVID. So it's not like a a frog in the boiling pot per se. It is in mm-hmm. a way, but mm-hmm. it was chaos, 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 chaos mm-hmm. to the point where you're living in this chaos. There, there's no time to think. Yeah. There's no time to understand what's going on. So it is a frog in the boiling pot in the sense of, you know, it's not slow to hot. It's just go, 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 go. And I always like to say with some movies, movies can have a huge plot gaps of things that don't make sense. But if it's quick enough, you don't have time to think about what has just happened to process it until way later. And you're like, oh, out of it. And you're like, oh my God, how did I enjoy this while it was going on? It just sounds like you're in this boom, 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 boom. You don't even have time to feel. Mm -hmm. No, I definitely think that was the problem. I mean, it was, it was so like, it was slow at the beginning where he was like the charming type. But then when the physical, like, it was just so fast, everything. And like all the conflicts just really started to cause the stress too. Um, Like while he was living at my parents' house, we had went out to get food. And I remember I came back and I fell asleep. And the next morning, like he got mad because he had to eat it all alone. And he like hit me in the face and my nose started bleeding. And I remember I had just like showered and I like looked down at my robe And I was just, I mean, there was blood everywhere and I'm just like sobbing on the floor and he would storm out and like, I, I would tell him like, oh, I'm sorry. Like, it's like, I'm so sorry. And always I would apologize to him because then I would start feeling bad that he ate alone. Um, when it, when that was just so minor compared to what he had just done. Um, but December of 2021, he wanted to move in together. And his dad had agreed to pay the rent and then I would pay everything else. And so this was like his dad now being the financial enabler. Um, He didn't like since he didn't have a job and he was only going to school um, and I was working full time at that point. I like all my money was just going towards like anything and I couldn't save for anything. I mean, I paid for all of the groceries, like basically everything and he did smoke a lot, so I was paying for all his weed. Um, and then I ultimately had no time alone, which was definitely like a big thing for me. I feel like I'm a little more introverted. So not having this alone time and working a full-time job and then coming home to someone who's not doing anything all day was was hard for me to adjust to. Um, and then this is where I started helping him with his school. and. I make a joke that I probably could have gotten another degree with the amount of homework and exams that I had helped him with. Um, I do believe that I started doing this because of the affection and the gratitude that he would show me after helping him. And it would feel kind of like we were back where we started two years prior. But then at some point, it just became expected and the gratitude would slowly go away and it would be more anger if I hadn't did- done it like it was almost expected that I do his homework for him so I just started to feel like this added responsibility I'm doing his homework for him and working a full-time job and paying for his weed and so I was like definitely a little confused at that point but just trying to keep the peace were you resentful I did start to feel a little resentful but I did also feel like I had some like free time at work and I was like, okay, if I have a little bit of free time at work, I'll do it. I mean, I would tell him I don't always have the time to do it. And I would emphasize that, but he would still get angry if it wasn't done. So he decided to give me a new promise ring Christmas that year. We're living together. And I do think this was another tactic to reel me back in. Um, He was definitely feeling me probably pull away a little bit. And like, as you said, definitely resenting him for doing his homework for him. So that pulled me in and like just 
started the cycle over. Um, this brings me to where we had a trip and we went to Florida and we were staying at my grandpa's place. And I remember we were at the gym before and he thought I had checked someone out. And so he said he was no longer coming. And this was like an hour before we had to go to the airport or call the Uber. And I remember begging him to come because I was just so confused. Like I wasn't doing this thing that he thought I was doing. And it, it's been like years of him saying I was. So I really did start to believe it at that point. So eventually you both did get to your grandfather's in Florida. You were very sleep deprived coming in. And on the first night, there was an incident in the lobby and your grandfather was informed of this and wanted to talk to both of you about it. So walk us through this. And he said, I heard the way that he was yelling at me in the elevator or other people had heard that. And like, that wasn't right. And when we get, we go downstairs, my ex and I go downstairs and there were security guards that were talking to him too, saying, you can't touch her like that. Like we have a video of you. And obviously he's like, I didn't do anything wrong. Like tell them I did nothing wrong. So we ended up leaving my grandparents and his dad ended up buying an Airbnb for us somewhere else. So again, his dad financially enabling him. How does your grandfather feel about this, that you have now left his home to go with this person where you didn't have to do anything to alert anyone. Security and everyone saw what happened and yeah. you're going. So what is going on there? Is your grandfather calling your parents? Are the security people saying like, what are you doing? And yeah. then also you knew this person from middle school and, you know, before you went to university did other people reach out to you or you reach out to people from that era to discuss like, did this person might have problems that I never knew of back then? Yeah. So my grandpa was very upset. I mean, the video is proof enough that he was very physical, um, but he wasn't going to force me to stay. I mean, in a situation like that, it's the person has to see it. And I actually didn't even watch the video until a couple years later because I was, I think I was just too scared to face the truth at the moment. Um, I hadn't reached out to anybody else because, I mean, it was that whole thing. He would say, like, this is our relationship, like, leave people out of it. So I, yeah, no, I was not reaching out to people. Um, like, I guess I just didn't want to believe it. What are the feelings attached to that? Honestly, embarrassment. I feel like I was definitely embarrassed, especially for staying with him for as long as I did. Um, I know that it happens to many women, but I think that was definitely one of the more like more prevalent feelings. Um, so going home after this trip, there was now more tension with my family. Um, my grandpa sent the video that he got from the complex of him being physical with me. And he sent it to my mom and there was really nothing that she could say at that point, but she did kind of like plant a seed in my head and said, like, we will help pay for rent if you move out. Um, but like, we'll figure it out. So she kind of planted that seed. Um, but there was not, I mean, he read the text and kind of knew he turned it, flipped it said like of course she's gonna say that um but you you just stay here like all that kind of stuff so it wasn't until february 14th 2022 so this is a month after this incident in florida that we got into a fight and i left for the first time and i went to my parents house and i remember running in and then him running in after me and demanding the key to his apartment and I stayed with my parents for maybe like an hour. And I remember them saying to me, like, everything's going to be okay. Like, we'll figure it out. Um, but then he used the tactic where he said he was going to kill himself. And so I went back and then I was there and I decided to stay. 
And so now there was really no contact with my family because of that. So I went back and um, he obviously wasn't going, he obviously didn't do it, but um, he, I remember his parents showing up too. So now it's me, him, and both his mom and his dad, and we're all in this apartment. And he's like telling them all the things I do wrong. And they're just like, well, you can't do that. Like telling me I can't do that stuff. So they're fully enabling him. Now they're paying for this rent here. And I'm like, well, there's other people that are telling me I can't do this stuff. So like, maybe I am doing it. Um, but he would start to tell me like horrible things. Like he would tell me to get a box ready in case he wanted me to leave again. And I mean, one of the worst things was like, he said he was going to have sex with somebody else and record it and then make me watch it. Started saying he was cheating on me, but then would take it back later. So I honestly don't know if he was telling the truth or just trying to upset me. But our apartment ended up being infected with rodents. So we had to move in with his parents. And at this point, things were like, okay, I don't. Well, how are you feeling day to day? Like when you wake up in the morning how do you actually feel? And when you think about your day, what does that day look like? Are you saying to yourself, I have to get from here to here to here. If I get to here and I'm safe, if this happens, blah, blah, blah. Like I got to that point, I got to there. I got to get to like 9 PM and then I'm allowed to say that I'm going to bed or something. Like, yeah. Are you creating like a war plan? Yeah. I, I did start to be like, I need to just wake up in the morning and get out and get to work. It was really just get to work. So I have the time alone. Um, and then once I get back, just kind of stay awake up until 10 and then I'm good. And it would be that same cycle over and over again. I mean, I, st I was, he was kicking, he, it felt like he was kicking me out every, when we lived at the first place, he was kicking me out like on the daily for the smallest things. Um, like he had a dog and so it was I walk the dog or I clean this before I go um and so it felt like I had a specific routine that I had to do before I left and so it was like do these things and get out um but after we moved in with his parents I mean I just that was probably the most one of the most isolated I felt I mean I'm with his parents who are clearly enabling him and at this point, I did think about going home, um, but since he had driven such a wedge between now my family and I, I didn't even ask. So eventually you were convinced things would get better once you both moved out of his parents' place and into an apartment of your own again. So you make this move with him, and what happens from here? Yeah, the physical abuse escalated the worst while we were there. Um, like, he would hit me in the face, um, hit me in the head so hard that, like, my eyes would go black, throw me on the ground, like, choke me, spit on me. He once took my head and slammed it into the shower. Um, and, I mean, I even remember him saying, like, I'm hitting you in the head or the arms and the legs so you can hide it and you won't see bruises on the head. Um, and then at one point he had said he could kill me and get away with it. Um, so I am starting to be scared now. <laughs> um, then he voiced that he wanted me to quit my job and he wanted to sell his car. And at that point I could really like feel myself, like feel myself, getting lost and like him closing in on the last bits of alone time I had. I mean, if I quit my job, I would be going nowhere. And if we only have one car, he's going nowhere. And so that really scared me. Um, I remember talking to his mom about how I didn't want to quit my job. And she had said, like, sometimes you have to make sacrifices. And I was like, well, okay, if you say so. Um, they're not just enablers. Like they are part, they are part of this. This isn't just enabling. This isn't just enabling. Like this is yeah. another, like they're in this with him. 
Like this is like, cause when I'm thinking of an enabling family, they're just like passing off the buck to like somebody else or whatever. Cause they don't want to deal with the problem. Yeah. They are part of this problem more than I think I've heard in many instances. They're really reinforcing what he is saying yeah. and the, it's possibly the whole family of whatever goes on with their, their mantras, their slogans, their beliefs are now y- invading you and he's using them to reinforce everything. They yeah. are, they are not just an enabler. They are a flying monkey enabler who is an authority figure who you are looking up to Mm -hmm. for guidance and they this is a cult yeah it's very this is a cult Mm -hmm. yeah i mean i there was one point where um i got in an argument with him and his sister had seen kind of what happened and she threatened to call the police on him and then i saw her out like a couple weeks later and she had said to me like he's a narcissist I was like, oh, someone on his family is kind of seeing this. Um, But, I I mean, I still, I did kind of start doing research on the word. But, I mean, at this point, I'm just a little scared. And, like, he's he's done a lot. Like, there had been so much physical abuse now. And his parents are, like, telling me I should do it. Like, quit my job, too. And so, um, I think that the point that really changed it for me was when can I ask, sorry, sorry, can I have, before you get into the point, that point, just remember where you were. What is the parent's reason for you to quit your job? What parent is going to tell a kid, quit your job? Like, what is their plan? What is their plan for you? Yeah, I don't really know what their plan was for me because he, because he didn't have a job either. Um, he, Besides, and he hadn't even graduated school. I think that he was telling them he was going to pursue a passion and like a dream. And he started having like all of these goals that he wanted to do. Like, I'm pretty sure like he wanted to become like a famous soccer player, um, a famous rapper. I mean, there were like so many different goals that he had, but like he wasn't really doing the steps to do it. But they were like, we'll still support you. Um, and that he was telling them he needed my support too. So if I was not working, I would be able to like, I think emotionally support him is where he was coming from. Um, so I'm not really. So they wanted you to quit your job so you can emotionally support him in a dream that was not realistic. Yeah. I mean, when you put it like that, yes, that is exactly what they wanted. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the point that like really changed it for me was when I kind of was like, I'm going to leave. I didn't, hadn't decided I was leaving yet, but this was where he, I remember him saying to me that I wasn't going to leave this place alive. It was either off the balcony or another way. And then he started laughing and he said something along the lines of, isn't it funny how much control I have? And that was like, definitely where I started to realize like why does he have this much control over my life like he gets to choose if I live or die like that doesn't make sense and so that was where I started to slowly plan like get my escape plan um I started looking for apartments and I was going to try to wait for him to fall asleep and I remember having a text draft for my parents saying to leave the garage door open and tell them I was coming home. But like, I just couldn't get myself to send it. I mean, it was just, I couldn't do it. I remember having it open and being like, okay, I can do this and not being able to do it. So this, so now we're the day before I'm supposed to quit my job. And we go to his parents' house and they're like supporting him and all that. And I was already doubting my decision. And I remember we get back to the house and a guy walks by and he goes why did you look at him and I I just was like uh because he walked by and he said how are we supposed to be together if you can't even stop looking at other guys like give me a reason to stay with you 
And I remember saying to him, like, I don't have a reason. And I think it was at that point he started to realize, like, I was very serious. So he started apologizing for, to me and, like, trying to pull me back in. But that did not work. And so the next morning, I remember saying, I'm leaving. And, like, he wouldn't let me move or he wouldn't let me leave. And he was, like, standing in the way. And I remember yelling at him to get out of the way. And he went into the bedroom and shut the door. And I remember sprinting. Um, and at the time, we did have, we had just gotten two kittens, like, probably a week before. And I remember calling my mom from the car. And I said, I want to come home. And I have two kittens I want to take with me. And so she said, okay, we'll go today. And I remember getting to work, calls and texts, blowing up my phone. I mean, he was back to saying he was going to kill himself, telling me he was going to throw all my clothes away, and then started saying he was going to post all my nudes online. And at this point, like, none of this really, I mean, it didn't feel real, like, that all this was happening. Um, I kind of felt that now I had told my mom I was coming home, like, I was coming home. Um, so I called the police and ended up going there and they told me I had five minutes to get as much as I could. Um, and the first thing I grabbed was the two kittens that I got and I ran them out to my mom and I look in the closet and like all my clothes were gone and they wouldn't let me, the police wouldn't let me stay any longer. So I just took what, whatever I could find. I mean, I don't, it was just like random clothes that I had on the floor. And then he started telling me that I owed him money for rent because his dad was paying this new rent too. Um, but luckily, I was able to get him to sign his name out of the my, sign my name out of the lease, and like quite literally manipulate the manipulator is what I've heard. Um, so when he would tell me that I owed him money, I would just sign send him this signed lease that said I'm not even part of it anymore. So at this point. I'm moved. I'm moving out and it was decided I did get movers and I moved out and I was living at home again. And I just remember like sitting on the, like sleeping on just a mattress. Cause like there was no bedrooms for me anymore. I'm in the basement with my two cats and just on a mattress. And I felt like at peace. I mean, I slept for like 10 hours the first couple nights because my body had been in such fight or flight mode for like two years. I mean, I felt very at peace there. <laughs> um, and also just being back with my parents, um, since we were so close before we, like before this relationship, I think it just felt safe. Finally. Um, we did talk on and off, but I never like stayed at that apartment again. I did move out. And then May, 2022. So about four months after I moved out and he's like still texting me and stuff. I did block him on everything and I went no contact because he had told me to kill myself. So this is where the smear campaign started. I mean, he started posting about me on Facebook saying that I was into his best friend, saying I was into his brother-in-law. Um, I mean, just saying all this stuff about me. His sister even messaged me saying that I was a slut for getting with her fiance. And at that point, I was very confused because I was, I thought she was on my side, but she was an enabler too, or, or even just believing him. Um, I also had messaged a couple of his friends on Instagram telling them that he needs to leave me alone um, or I'm getting a restraining order. None of them answered me. So at that point, I was like, okay, so there's a little bit of these people I can't trust, kind of realize, kind of weeding out the people I can't trust now. Um, he was leaving me like notes on my car, comments on Venmo posts. I mean, really anything to try to get in contact me, with me again. He, I had to change my phone number and he even showed up to my parents' house. And luckily I was out of town that weekend. And he was just talking to my dad, like, calling me names, but then saying, isn't it crazy how much I love her? Like, and we had a ring. And so I was watching all this in real time, basically real time, like watching him kind of have both sides of him. 
um, his parents would even text my parents and try to get us to meet up and say that, like, we love each other and try to get us to get back together. So that was that was the crazy part. Um, But I would I never had agreed to meet up with him. So it didn't go anywhere. But I think he was having like a collapse. Like, I don't know what the, the term for it is, but I think he was having like a breakdown. Um, I wouldn't call it a breakdown. I would say that like he was in obsession and fixated on you yeah. and you, you know, when someone is obsessed with something that is scary and he has convinced everyone else that his obsession was normal all of these people are going along with it his parents again here are a part of it in a disgusting way yeah and they're enabling something that is scary a, a, a physical abuser that has threatened your life and they're not doing anything about it. Not that they're being told a hundred percent of the truth, but at the yeah. same time, his parents know what he is like. And saying that he, when you said that, um, he, not that he, his parents know everything. One of the things he did say to me was I told my mom, everything I did, I had done to you. And she said that like, she didn't say anything about it. Like she didn't even think that was wrong. Um, and I, who even knows if he had told her everything. Um, so after all this is happening, like it goes quiet a little bit for like the summer. I mean, he was still trying to talk to me. Like he, w- we did, unfortunately did work out at the same gym cause I worked there t- still. Um, but he kept his distance. Um, and he would say he was moving to a different, he said he was moving to Paris. So I remember he saw me outside of the gym once and said, like, I'm moving. Can you just talk to me? And I said, no, you please move. <laughs> and he was like, OK, like, I'm being serious. And I, I remember it being like, and I'm being serious, too. But it was just all these like he was just making stuff up. I think it was anything to talk to me. Um, and it wasn't until October 22, 2022, that he saw me talking to a coworker, um, and he kind of came over to both of us and like looked at us for like got really close into our face, but didn't say anything at first, but then did say something kind of threatening. And since I worked there, I called the gym and I told them what had happened and they got him banned. And I kind of knew that that was going to like kind of set him off. So I didn't go for a few days and then I'm driving home a few days later And I feel someone behind me, like, tailing me. And I'm like, there's someone really close to me. And it's him driving so dangerously. Like, I mean, he was not driving safe at all. And it felt like I was going to drive off the road. And so I called the police and I said, like, my ex-boyfriend is trying to follow me home. And he is going to drive me off the road. But... They were like, tell me to pull over. And I was like, I, I really, I can't pull. If I pull over anywhere, like he's going to kill me. Like I remember saying that to them. Um, and I did pull into a parking lot and luckily there was one spot for me to park into. And so I pulled into the parking spot and I just yelled to the two ladies I first saw. I said, can you stand with me? Like my ex-boyfriend is following me home. And I remember he was driving so dangerously that he drove into this parking lot on the wrong side of the road. And so that kind of got people's attention. And then he got out of the car and started screaming at me for being a stalker. Um, So all this is happening. I mean, I felt pretty safe at that point because I, I mean, I wasn't doing any of that. I was on the phone with the police. And now there's these two ladies who are basically witnesses. Um, And then the police come and they said to go and get a protection order like now. And at the time, I didn't know that the office was open. Like, I had always thought it was during the week, like, nine to five hours. And I I worked nine to five. And so I was, like, always putting it off. But they were like, no, like, you can go on the weekends. And you were 
almost immediately granted. So we did go and I did get granted a protection order. And then a couple months later, I find out he's trying to appeal. And so I call up a lawyer and I tell him everything. And like a couple months before I'm supposed to have this appeal court date, um, he decides my ex decides to drop the appeal. So there was, I mean, after that, it had been like a year, a year of silence. There was, I mean, I didn't hear from him. I didn't see from him. I mean, after that, he was banned from the gym. I, I ended up moving. So he didn't know where I lived at that point. So everything was knock on wood good then. Um, I did start, I started to see a therapist in May, May, 2022. So back while like the stump, like the smear campaign and everything was happening, I did start to tell her about all that. And I remember like when I walked in there, I could barely even say I had been physically abused, like without choking up. So she definitely like really helped me like in a new perspective on things. Um, one of the things she even said that was like, Um, when I was debating getting the protection order was if this was your sister, like, what would you make her do? I was like, I would force her to get one. And she was like, so obviously you should do that. But, um, so during therapy, mm -hmm. did you recognize and go through the process of who you were at the beginning and then who you became and, you know, how all of those things happened? Like, did you go through, you know, the mechanizations of abuse and the loss of who you are? And were there parts of you that you felt were lost that you needed to figure out how to get back? Yeah, I mean, it was for the first couple of their sessions we had, and I saw her weekly. Um, it was hard to even say I was like, had been abused. So it was more just like, kind of talking through the situations that I went through. Um, but I didn't really get into the deep part until like at least a month or so in, but I definitely feel like talking it out and like talking about who I was before college, like how I was like, I mean, I played sports. I, I worked out all the time. I wasn't genuinely an anxious person, but then when I started dating him, became more anxious, didn't really work out as much. I mean, definitely did learn a lot. I mean, she did, she definitely helped me a lot and doing it weekly was more, it was helpful, repetitive to be repetitive in going, especially during the times when he's like bashing me on social medias or being threatening to me because I'm telling her all this and she's being like that kind of like the angel on your shoulder type of thing being like that is not okay um even though other people are hearing about it also just hearing that too but I think it was just it definitely was hard because I did know him in high school so thinking that I was going through all this it just didn't feel real still so she kind of like helped me navigate more of the red flags like when I started to date again she kind of helped me learn what was healthy, create healthy boundaries for myself. Um, and I like, I did end up dating someone else and it was a healthy relationship. And she was like, so this is what a healthy relationship is like. Um, and I remember telling the person that I had been with everything that I went through with my other ex and the, him being very supportive. So it was like to sit back and see two completely different relationships definitely gave me a different perspective on things. Um, I even reached out to the old roommates and friends that had, I had been isolated from and voice, I told them everything that had happened and how he had definitely like done all that on purpose, um, reached out and tried to make amends with them and tried to now trying to just build the last, the, make up for the lost time that he took away from me. So while you're in this healing process, another scary thing does happen again when it comes to him because he is obsessed. He is a stalker. That protection order was needed. Yeah. And then 
I think something happens, what, two days after the protection order ends, he show, yeah. he shows up again like clockwork. Yes. So I actually was getting like anxiety leading, leading up to this protection order ending. And I get to the gym and I, he pulls up behind me. And I remember just like, like, he's like trying to talk to me. He's telling me I'm suicidal. He's like on his knees, like begging to talk to me. And I mean, at this point it had been a year since I'd heard from him. Like I was, I didn't need any of this. I was, I was more healed and I wasn't going to fall for it. And I was just trying to make a scene. I mean, I just wanted someone to get involved. And so I tried calling the police, but they told me I needed to send the address and I didn't have service. So I just started taking videos of him and like being like, this is me recording you to get out of the way. And at some point I was able to move my car and put it in the handicapped spot outside the gym. And when I walked in, um, someone was already at the front desk saying they heard an argument in the parking garage and that it was escalating. And I was like, that's me. Um, please call the police. So the police came and I told them everything and said that he's physically abusive and I have not seen him for over a year and my order just expired. And then they said, um, they walked me to my car and I started to leave the gym and then he was following me again. And at this point I was like, I'm not having that same instance again from a year ago. And so I do a U-turn and I go back and I say to the police officer that he's now following me. And so he says that he'll follow me home. And so I start to drive home. And at this point, I see my ex's car now on the opposite side of the road. And then he does a U-turn and he's now in front of me. So I like put my hand outside of my car and I motion to the police officer that now he's in front of me and he is able to pull him over. And so I immediately go and get another order, peace order this time. And the cop actually calls me and tells me that he hopes I had enough time to get home. And he says to me that my ex has mental issues. And so I need to get another order, which I did. And I think it was on a, it was almost reassuring to hear law enforcement say like he has mental issues. Um, I feel like hearing it from other people is something else, but hearing it from someone who's in the law, it just makes a difference. Um, so this time I showed up to court with my lawyer and I had to be put on the stand and share all the physical abuse while looking at him. And I mean, it definitely wasn't easy, but I remember it being like a good feeling because to just stand up to like someone like that. Um, at the time I had those videos that I took of him and my lawyer was showing him the videos, like my ex. And I like, remember, I remember sitting there watching like his mask fall. Like he was really trying all his power to hold it together, but his face was just pure anger. I mean, he was so angry. Um, I ended up getting granted the appeal or, or the peace order, but um, he did appeal it again. So we went back to court and this time he brought a lawyer. And honestly, his lawyer, like both of our lawyers ended up kind of figuring it out. I remember his lawyer being like, even saying to mine, like, I don't even know why I'm here. Like, obviously you guys are going to win. Um, but they said everything to him like this is like this will be granted you cannot talk to her text her nothing but this time after since he had tried to appeal it this order was almost more like ironclad like even if he tries to reach out to me through a third party like he will go to jail um and i remember i looked over at him in the court and he like he was clenching his jaw so hard and one of the other things I remember was nobody from his family came to any of these court dates. I mean, we have gone now three times and every single time he was alone. And I feel like that definitely says something about his family. Like they'll enable and encourage him, but at the end of the day, they're not really supporting him. Um, and every single time I wasn't alone, um, my mom came to every single one of them with me. So. Things are continuously looking up now. No contact with him or anyone close to him. And I'm just 
extremely grateful for my family and they stayed with me through such a rough time but i'm finally starting to feel strong and free again and if you had any words of wisdom for everyone listening what would they be so yeah a couple of things that i actually did think about pretty recently um the biggest advice and words of wisdom i have is that if you're dealing with a situation like this or even if you like deep down know what they're doing to you is wrong like you you know and i know it's scary but sometimes most often not the grass is greener on the other side and then one of the quotes that someone had told me that stuck with me the most was it is better to be alone than to be with someone who makes you feel alone i mean at one point i remember hearing that or like seeing it somewhere and being like okay i would rather be alone at this point well blanche i really want to thank you for being our guest on our show today you've been through a lot all different types of abuses emotional, physical abuse, psychological abuse, and not just from your ex, but from the enablers, the family, the friends, and everything there. And it's a scary and lonely place to be. And I'm happy that you are free of this. And I hope that these, you know, protection orders uh, continue to help you. You know, it's not the case for everyone. But, you know, this really helped you to make you feel safe. And I hope that you live the life that you want to live and free of having to deal with them and help with, you know, whatever issues with PTSD and CPTSD, everything that went along with it. And everyone's giving you a big hug. You did a great job of explaining everything today. You were clear. And I really just can't thank you enough for, for being a guest here today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you once again, Blanche, for being our guest today. And if you want to be a guest like Blanche was today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. And there you can read all of our instructions and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our guest form and press the submit button. And please do send it in the format that we ask for. Also at our website, we have a support group at NarcissistApocalypse.com. So at NarcissistApocalypse.com, click on that support group button at the top of the page if you need support. Inside, you'll see that we have Zoom meetings every Wednesday night, Thursday afternoons, and Saturday nights. We have forum boards for you to post on to get the support that you need, to get the validation that you need from survivors just like you. You can make a lot of good friends on there as well. So if you need support, join our support group today. And if you need even more support, please do visit our friends at DomesticShelters.org. At DomesticShelters.org, they have articles and resources to help you make sense of what you're dealing with. They have every phone number, email address, and web address for shelters and agencies, no matter how big or small the town you're in. DomesticShelters.org has it there. It is a wonderful free resource and organization. So if you need help from them, you need extra support, go to DomesticShelters.org. And that is it for today's episode. So for myself and Blanche, we hope you have a good night.